Uh, so Simon Devonshire is a, a serial entrepreneur and an investor. He ran the business division of O2 in the UK for five years. Then he co-founded a business accelerator for Telefonica. Simon is here, by the way. Uh, simultaneously, he co-founded a slate of small businesses, including One Water, which was a, a brand of bottled water which uh, raised money for charitable projects in Africa, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, he's also been the entrepreneur in residence for the Department of business. What did that job involve you doing all day? Being entrepreneurial. <laughs> in residence? Exactly. So you were imprisoned in that vile tower block sort of, yeah. uh, that the Department of Business is in. Uh, Irene Graham is uh, beside him. She's the chief executive of the Scale Up Institute, which is a collaborative partnership to encourage the growth of scale ups. She's on the advisory board of the UK Business Angel Association. As a director of the British Bankers Association, she led the banking industry's policy work on small and medium sized enterprises, among others. And for many years, she was a senior executive at Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, John Reynolds is the co-founder and the chief executive of SwiftKey, which is a technology company that makes keyboard apps for iPhones and smartphones. The keyboard uh, autocorrects spelling and predicts your next word, though it doesn't cope terribly well, I've noted, with profanity. Uh, the company uh, was named as one of the hottest startups by Wired magazine. He was once named Young Tech Entrepreneur of the Year. And if you're wondering what sort of background does a swashbuckling, risk-taking entrepreneur like this have, he used to be a civil servant. <laughs> and Gareth Ramsey joined a small business called PH straight from university in the 17 years that he uh, worked there. Its business uh, turnover and its staff numbers grew by eight times, grew eightfold. Uh, that business was then bought by Experian in 2007 and Gareth is now the product director at the division known as Experian PH. It specialises in thought leadership on the evolving leadership population. I still don't know what that means. What does I'm that mean? I'm not too mean? sure myself, to be honest. Okay, yeah, fine. We, it out one day. we make it up as we go along. Right. Uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, factors that uh, help businesses scale up, the challenges that you meet as the business expands. And Gareth and John, I'm going to ask both of you just to talk us through the, the journeys that both of you have, have been on. Uh, John, I'll start with you. How did the business start? How did it grow? Great. Well, as, I, as I've just, everyone's just heard, I guess I started in the civil service, which is probably maybe the most unlikely incubator to some degree. But I think actually coming straight out of university into a job environment, you're surrounded by just so, so much change for me personally. I think I was in a meeting, um, it was actually with a Herbert Smith partner who was typing on a BlackBerry like this. And there was something about that moment. Some which, of them still do. <laughs> <laughs> and there was something about that moment, I think, which just summed up, actually, there's an opportunity here to make typing a lot better. And I think everyone you chat to, no one I've ever met says, they want their typing and their keyboard to be worse than their keyboard. It's a problem everyone relates to. So it was really an idea. Um, I then had the fortune, good fortune, of having a friend from university called Ben Medlock, who I co-founded the business with. He's the technical brains behind what we've built. He's got a PhD in natural language processing, machine learning. And really the partnership was him building out the technology, me building out the business. Um, and that's really kind of how we set up. And when you started the business, was it always your ambition that you would grow into a multi-million pound business, was that always there from day one or did it take a little while for that uh, to develop? I mean, it's interesting. I think really for us it was all about problem solving. We saw this opportunity. Um, I think the, the only business parallel we had at the time was T9, which was the old school kind of predicted text. That was in over a billion handsets. So I thought, wow, this is a massive market, let's go after it. And it really was a challenge for us. How far could we go? How many people could eventually kind of use our product? And over the first couple of years, we kind of got the product into marketplace. We started working with manufacturers. Um, we ended up signing Samsung, Sony, BlackBerry. We're one of the top 10 paid apps on, on Android. So we had a lot of success, but I think it was really from focusing on the problem. Um, and the kind of business success came out of that. Uh, Gareth, talk, when you joined PH, it was a fairly small uh, yep, business. 20, 20, Reasonable 20. numbers, but still small. Yep. Talk us through the growth story. Well, I guess we're here celebrating scale-ups, so businesses that grow very rapidly, almost as sprinters. We're more of a, um, a story of the marathon runner, so uh, we took probably 20 years to actually reach medium-sized business status. I think we probably hit £10 million turnover uh, maybe only five years ago, having started in, in 1987. Um, and I guess one of the things that I saw scrolling across earlier was uh, no growth without risk, and I guess that's maybe been 
Um, one of the differences between us uh, and some of the real scale-ups that, uh, that we're seeing today is that uh, we took a slightly more risk-averse approach. We, we grew um, very much in line with our pipeline. We didn't invest too far ahead of the curve, which has meant we've, a we've been able to um, achieve strong single-digit or double-digit growth more or less year on year for 25 years, um, but without ever really quite sort of pushing up that, that extra level of risk that's required to, um, to, to scale up and, and double in size over a you know, two, three, four-year period. Um, so maybe, maybe next year we'll be, we'll be celebrating the marathon runners rather than the sprinters, but uh, uh, it takes all sorts, I guess. The slow growth festival. The slow growth festival. Yeah. Not that slow. <laughs> <laughs> Slower. Um, Irene, some interesting sort of points emerging there. Mm -hmm. uh, at the core of both these businesses, a good solid idea uh, yeah. that had good commercial uh, application uh, and the ability for that to be expanded. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, any entrepreneur that I've often talked to will see see a problem, work out how you solve it, and then go for it if you've seen that an idea. And that's what is spoken about here. And I think the other <laughs> side of it is, and picking up again themes of earlier, I think when um, the Scale Up Institute, and which was born out of the Scale Up Report, looked at growth businesses and what hurdles they were facing. Um, much became focused on leadership and building leadership capacity. And I'm sure if you talked to the two chaps here, they would talk about how they've looked at that journey around the leadership of the company and how that's evolved from founder status to where you are now, getting the right skills in. And then access to markets. I noticed the, the factor about going global. And, and one of the things that we're seeing for all businesses that are scaling is that link between global expansion and innovation. And I think that's what comes through when you speak to businesses um, who are scaling, and it's part of the important area that we need to help them with. Simon, this might be a slightly heretical thought uh, to have at this event, but just picking up on what Gareth said, that uh, there is something to be said for uh, the uh, solid, unflashy growth that uh, is sustainable and solid. Absolutely. I mean, growing a business is not trivial, so I admire anybody that can consistently and sustainably do it, um, and, you know, those results are you know, eminently impressive. But the opportunity of the digital economy is a multiplying effect on that. It's the opportunity for exponential growth. It's the opportunity for businesses like John's to become truly global um, and perhaps not employ hundreds of thousands of people, but be used by potentially many millions of people. Uh, and that opportunity was pretty much unthinkable or certainly not accessible as recently as 15 years ago. So are there, uh, for you and for Irene as well, are there common factors that unite all fast-growing companies? Yes. Are there certain attributes that they've all got? Definitely, definitely. So um, I love the idea of you know, finding a problem that's worth solving. Um, you know, so one of my things that I advocate is, you know, what's your it's not right? So you know, the reason I created One Water is it's not right that two, million, two billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. And I think that you know, John saw people inexpertly operating a keyboard and thought it's not right and I can do that better. Um, talent, key attribute, um, that often is accompanied by a proven track record of demonstrable achievement. Uh, I think ambition, frankly. Um, you know, if you haven't got the will to want to scale up, you probably haven't got the stomach to go with the journey and the risks and the endeavour necessary to do it. But some of the biggest companies on earth now, one of the things that unites them is that they're still, if not literally founder-led, the legacy of the founder is inherent in their DNA. And I, I think, Simon, you, you would agree as well, just keeping that innovative and innovation, whether it's operationally in product, that rigorous focus on customers, is also quite a constant factor. Yeah. There's a constant almost reinventing and, and focus on how to innovate further. And that can be into a new market, it can be into a new product, um, but I think those two factors come across very strongly. And some work that Goldman Sachs did last week with the, the British Business Bank and Enterprise Research Centre really showed this innovation and export ambition as a critical factor in the scale. Does there have to be a point, Simon mentioned mm. effectively the mindset, does there have to be a point where you make a conscious decision to become a fast growing company, that it's not something you evolve into naturally, you have to consciously move the business in that direction? I think it's both. I think you have to have the mindset for the ambition, but also you can f find yourself growing pretty rapidly, unexpectedly, and that's when you have to be really agile. I think the word I use is a really agile 
mindset that's also got the ambition to take that risk on and, and grow. John, you said that fairly early on you realised that there was a, a great potential market for the product, but that's not the same thing as saying I'm going to go for as much of that market as I can possibly get. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, in today's world where you can launch an app, like Flappy Birds, for example, a developer kind of coded basically on, him, on his own and gets hundreds of millions of users. I think we're in an incredible world where literally by the press of the button, you've got access to the almost the entire globe, hundreds and hundreds of millions of consumers. And so I think the question is more about does your proposition, does your product fit and is it compelling for that user base uh, rather than the decision about how ambitious you want to be. I think maybe then there's a question about when you, when you have that initial kind of product market fit, how do you, where, where do you take that? Do you carry on innovating? Do you carry on leading the space that you're in? Do you carry on defining that and try and grow that user base? Or actually, are you happy with this, the size and scale that you've got to? And I think for us, I think we basically had no choice. Um, there were only 20 global uh, manufacturers of mobile phones that are really worth trying to do co contracts with. Mm -hmm. If you get Samsung, then you're on 250 million phones a year. That you haven't, you either, it's a binary choice. It's not something that you can kind of half get. Um, and so I think for us, it was very much a focus on just building the best products. Um, but I think also we did our, our very best to execute as the opportunities presented themselves. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned Samsung. Did that become the business, the, the company that you did business with because they approached you or because you targeted them or because it just, it just happened that way? I mean, essentially, we, we drew up a list of all the companies that we wanted to work with, and there's probably about maybe five that really, really were game changers, and there's probably 20 that were worth doing contracts with. And so for our sector, it was a lot of economy flights around the world to Korea, uh, to China, um, all these kind of different countries, and obviously the West Coast of America as well. It was very, very much global from kind of day one. But it wasn't that we had 20,000 com companies we had to cold call every day. It was just literally trying to knock that door down. Um, and to be realistic, you get turned down, I don't know, 49 times, and it's the 50th time that you finally make that proposition work. But that was over one year, two years, 18 months of hard work. Um, and often it would take, I don't know, a year to get beyond just for UK country managers to actually get to headquarters. So I'd definitely say that for anyone wanting to go and, and win multi-million dollar contracts as a small startup, you've almost got to be stupidly naive to even think that you, it's possible for that to be a, an outcome. And I think then just so single-mindedness and, and kind of persistent just to not, to, kind of, to make sure that you kind of get that deal at the end of the day. Uh, Gareth, how important was being stupidly naive in, in your business plan? <laughs> well, well I, I guess maybe the problem was we weren't stupidly naive enough. We were, uh, <laughs> we were founded by, uh, by a guy whose uh, background was in the Boston Consulting Group. So, you know, he had a lot of strategic consulting background um, to begin with and was therefore very conscious of, of the risks of, uh, uh, of what he was taking on and, uh, and managed that accordingly, which is, which is why we, we saw maybe the, the solid but, but slightly slower growth story um, within PH. Simon, this is the this is the mindset. Exactly, I think it's it's you know the point is it's it's a deliberate uh, endeavour. Mm -hmm. Now it may not be a conscious one because some people are just drawn to this in a way that the same way as musicians are compelled to be in a in a rock band or whatever. Um, but my worry is that it's becoming a prerequisite for not just success but even at a more basic level, just viable business. So for those business leaders who don't have that challenger mentality and the ambition to grow, they're possibly not taking on the type of interventions that are necessary just to run you know, a viable business. You're making it sound like a factor that is more than just nice to have. Exactly that. It's almost essential, exactly. borderline preeminent. In my view. In your view. In my view, yeah. What if that's just not part of your, either your own personal makeup as the founder of the business or not part of the, the culture of the organisation as you've developed yeah, yeah, no, it? I totally understand the question. I think it's a real dilemma because you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. So if you, if you go for it, you know, there's a lot of hard work. And if you don't, then your business is in for a, you know, a fairly tumultuous kind of journey, really. And I think either way, it's not easy. You know, I liken that to uh, what's happened in sport. Sport has increasingly become you know, a high performance activity. When I was a kid, you, know, you could literally walk out of the pub and onto a rugby field. You can't do that anymore. And you know, businesses have become increasingly like that. 
Can you fake it? I don't think you can because I think that um, it, it, to a large extent it is about authenticity, you know, more than ever before. So it's not that long ago, it's only five years ago when most CEOs felt that a good CEO ship was to be invisible, you know, closeted, protected and in the background. You know, in a digital world, it's the other way around. You know, the boss of Aston Martin said that rather than being the least inaccessible person, he now needs to be the most accessible person. Yeah. Ronan Dunn at O2 talks about using Twitter to walk the shop floor. You know, um, so these are not trivial things. It's a big undertaking. Gareth, what were your tactics for growing the business? Well, to begin with, I mean, we, we, were, uh, we were very much a... a sort of family style business, it wasn't actually a family business, but it, it, it was very much run in that style when we were small. It, there was the, um, the MD and, um, you know, and he basically went out doing all of the sales leads and the rest of the, the team who were almost exclusively graduates straight out of university like myself um, were, were essentially doing the work and doing the consulting with clients. Um, and then you reach the point around probably between 20, 30 employees where you have to start delegating some of that responsibility. Then you reach the point around 50, 60 employees, half a million pounds, uh, f sorry, five million pounds turnover, where you have to start thinking about all the back end functions. At that point, we were still um, run with a, a part time accountant working three days a week doing all the payroll, all of the invoicing. Um, and then I think you reach the, the point where you have to make a choice. You either have to start investing in all of that back end functionality, or you do what we did, which is to be, be acquired by a, a much larger business that has all of that in place already. And that then pushed us on to the next level of growth. And um, I mean, it, it's entirely hypothetical. Who knows whether we would have been able to continue the growth path that we did throughout the recession had we not been acquired by Experian um, just before it. But, um, but, but that was how we, we kind of managed to, to push on by, um, by, by essentially bringing in or, or, or being brought into Experian and taking on all of the, the sales team, the HR, the finance functions, the marketing, and so on. So you needed to acquire yourself a bit of bureaucracy. Effectively, yeah. Uh, John, is that the stage your business is at beyond it? approaching it yeah. well, it's a really hard balance i think i know it's the first company I've, I, I've built and i think looking at at the scaling of, of the team and the management um i think if i go back to all of the problems which are really hard problems they're all people related um essentially everything else you'll find a way of solving it but relationships are at the heart of business i believe and i think particularly as you grow how do you keep your core team at the beginning motivated as you have to make some role changes you want to keep key people in the business, but potentially need to bring in someone with a bit more experience in certain areas. A lot of those transitions, you just learn the hard, hard way because you do things wrong. Um, but I would say that at a certain level, yeah, you have to have um, a proper finance function. You have to have an element of, of HR and other factors because essentially if you want to have a great culture, you have to invest in how that, that business is, is running. And so I think at a certain point, you want to become as, as efficient as possible. Um, as a small business, it's all about trying to I guess leanism is used a lot, but essentially trying to make sure that we're using as much resource as possible um, on producing the product. Um, as we've scaled, we've had to add in, I guess, elements of overhead to enable the business to function. And I think I would just say in hindsight, I think, um, yes, we're now probably in a good phase where we've, we've gone through very rapid growth. We've probably stabilized a bit and we, we're probably a bit more comfortable in how we're running things. But going through that transition is something that you have to be very careful to bring the whole company with you mm. and make sure you don't leave people behind and. So why, why are you more comfortable now than you were previously? I think maybe just we went through a period for probably three years where we doubled pretty much every single year. So going from kind of 20 to 40 to 18, now we're around 100, 140. Um, I'm sure there's lots of tech companies that have grown a lot faster. Um, and, and I don't know if we'd carry on growing at that pace, how we'd have scaled and, and dealt with that. But I think fundamentally, having had a year where we've, we've decided to keep our high count roughly around the, kind of that kind of level, I think it's given us a bit of a breather and a chance to kind of get things right. I think additionally, because our customers are so global, we've set up an office in Korea, uh, we've set up an office in the West Coast. Those are both eight hours of, away from each other time zone wise. And so again, you've got to be very committed to making, like as a small company, being a global company, um, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but actually how do you excel on a global culture when you haven't really got the resources of the big company to, to achieve that? So there's a lot of early morning phone calls, a lot of Google Hangouts, a lot of kind of travel as well, and that's the only way to really make it work. I mean, such an interesting point is how you maintain the culture of a small company when yeah. you become a bigger company. Does it matter if you fail to maintain that culture? Isn't it just a part of growing up that you stop being this small, cuddly, friendly place that everyone loves to work in? 
No, I think I, that's almost <laughs> like saying if I'm a child growing into an adult but rapidly doing that, I've lost my innate self. So I think you actually have to have at the core your core values and your core strategy. You have to have that set so firmly that you can expand and take on the rapid growth because it's such a core part of your DNA. So I'm a very firm believer on being very focused on strategy and very focused on um, what your core aims are and how that populates through. Now, it does mean you've got to get the right team around you. That can be inside the company, but also I think there's also about the support you have outside, okay. what mentors you have that you can talk to externally about how you're creating and going through that growth phase um, because I think that's that's absolutely essential but I for me think you know being very set on your values and your strategy are critical as you go on that growth journey and a theme that you flagged up earlier and it's important mm. we discuss it in a bit more detail now is the importance of leadership yeah yeah You've, you've got, the, the leadership has to be able mm. to, and Simon touched on it as well when he was talking about CEOs, there's a point at which you're the founder um, and you need to step back and decide should you be the CEO or shouldn't you, should you actually be <coughs> moving upwards and uh, bringing someone else in and what to, and those are difficult transitions to go through, um, but they are the important elements of leadership that will take you further. Mm, and fleshing mm. out the leadership at the top of the business that you're bringing in uh, you're bringing not just making that decision about whether you run it or not, no, but also you're where the are strengths. the gaps in skills and who exactly. do we bring in? And always assessing that and always being clear about that. And sometimes it, it's building that, yeah, the Olympian building the Olympic team around you. And some of it will come from your, your internal sources, some will come in from recruitment, some will come from external sources that you will always want to use as your sounding boards. But doesn't that bring us back to the earlier question then about the payoff between culture and expansion? that you, the culture will, by definition, change because you've brought in all these outsiders. I'm, I'm, if you do the right, if you've got a very core, you talked about HR and building the right sort of recruitment process around it, you can, I believe, continue to build the culture and build the right team around that. Simon, how good are we at developing, you know, we talk about skills a lot and that ends up usually talking about apprentices or graduates. In terms of our ability to develop the skills skill sets of leaders of fast-growing companies. How good are we at that? Mixed, I suppose. So um, if you look specifically at our graduate sort of output, um, it's alarming to see that in a digital economy, some of our graduates that suffer the highest rates of unemployment are actually in computer science. Uh, and having interviewed some of them who, who have presented themselves at interview clearly unclean, uh, they're quite difficult to employ, would be my observation. Sorry, um, unclean? Unclean. <laughs> you mean unwashed? Unwashed, <laughs> literally. I didn't need to ask the question either, Declan, it was sort of apparent. Obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and Discussion's you know, taken an unusual turn. Exactly that. <laughs> so, you know, when, when we're trying to build leaders for the future, you know, that, that inherently is quite a challenge when we are so short of digital skills. So, you know, it's more than just teaching kids how to code. Um, you know, one of the, the inherent skills that I see in fantastic leaders is intuition. And I worry that at a young age, what do we do to actually foster that and build confidence and courage in, in, in young people? Uh, equally, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a, an ageing workforce that has the most extraordinary experience, but is often seen as you know, in some way not being compelling from an employment point of view, which is just crazy. We need to it is now... massively rich in skills and Exactly. Experience. So we need to more forcibly, in my view, I know this is quite controversial, I've always been very anti-positive discrimination, but now I just think it's inevitable that we, we have to create more diversity in the workplace. Uh, and I think that if that isn't going to happen naturally through market forces, then some intervention is necessary to make it happen. I mean, just on that point of developing the leadership toolkit mm. of the founders of businesses, mm. running a business is fairly lonely at the best of times. Yeah. Uh, where on earth do you turn to to uh, sort of get that evaluation of yourself and uh, that plan to develop your own skills? Well, I think, I think there's a range of programmes, and we'll be looking to showcase more of them, that are in the UK today 
that are helping businesses do that, whether it be the Stock Exchange Elite Programme, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Business Programme, mentoring programmes that, 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 that exist. Um, so there are a building set of support frameworks to, 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 to businesses. I do think, and I was just struck by the relentlessness of John's journey in getting into some global corporates, I do think there are more and more global corporates looking uh, at how they can support their supply chains, not just by orders, but actually by you know, helping them develop the skills and leadership and different programs around that. And I think that's a really important factor. So the big companies how, are the top how they reaching can down really the supply reach chain. down and support. And there are, you know, there's various numbers of incubators and other areas that are growing, John, John this example of one. But I do think as well how, they, how that is continued through the growth of the company is a really important thing. And I do think you should leverage um, as a growth company into your customer base. And it um, sort of mirrors what Gareth did in, in, in terms of the, the sale mm. of the business to Experian, meant that uh, you were putting yourself into <coughs> their established structure for developing leaders that I'm assuming existed. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we've always um, developed the leaders through the business rather than uh, recruiting them from the outside. But obviously by becoming part of Experian, we've been able to tap into that much larger, much more global um, context. You know, obviously they have all sorts of training courses that um, that we've been able to tap into. That uh, previously we, you know, we really very much just learned on the job as we were going along, which can take you so far. Uh, but th there mm. comes a point where you know, the actual formal training and, uh, and education is, is necessary. Uh, John, that type of discussion that Irene was describing there, up and down the supply chain, are those conversations that mm. you have had with some of the bigger companies you do business with? Um, I guess not. It's not something we probably directly had, had experience with in our sector. I mean, I think I would say that if you look at a lot of the, the big tech companies, I would say they've had an incredible, incredibly positive impact on the wider tech community. So I think if I look at, I don't give examples like Google or Facebook or others in, in London, I think they've probably been one of the, most, the biggest drivers of, of a tech initiative um, within, within the UK. I don't think I've personally experienced kind of leadership training or development in, in that sense. Um, however, I would say that I think you need to surround yourself with people who've done it before. Um, and, I, and I'm a really strong believer that sometimes we're a little bit too impatient when we look at the tech scene in the UK. I'm very, very bullish on the 10, 20, 30 year opportunity, which is when this first generation of tech companies comes through, um, they have, have been acquired, there's experience gained both sides of that transaction. That money, that experience um, goes back into the next startups and it kind of keeps coming through. I think one of the things we felt um, as we got to a certain point was that we had to look internationally to gain the experience of people who had done it before. Um, and I think one of the things that attracts people to places like Silicon Valley is you're surrounded by those people. Um, so I, I definitely feel that things, things are improving. Um, I think it, it takes the initiative to go out there and, and make sure you, you attract it. Um, but I think for us, we definitely take a, we try and take a very kind of global approach on getting the right experience into the business. I think, I, just say, I think that's a really good point, and I guess in that journey as well, John, you've maybe looked at your board or your advisory board, who you've gone around that makeup and what experience they're bringing, bringing as well, because I do definitely think looking at that broader landscape is important. Uh, let's open the uh, discussion up. Anyone who has a, a question or an observation, just put your hand up and keep it up, sir, until we get the microphone to you. There's one here. If there's uh, one on the other side of the room, if you can put your hand up, we'll uh, 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 get John Mortimer, well. Angela Mortimer. Um, um, this question for John. I'm really interested in. Uh, you you have about 150 people now. It took two people to write the app and sell it to whoever it was. What the other hell are the other 148 people doing? Hey, <laughs> payroll. <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? They're all on the beach. No. <laughs> um, I think. Um, I think. Look, we're in a actually pretty technically challenging area. So if you look at what we're doing. We're trying to build a keyboard which is better than um, all of the incumbents, whether that's Google or Apple, and we've led that market for five years. So we have a huge investment in R&D. Um, around two thirds of our engineers are actually kind of master's degree or above. We've got something like 17 PhDs. So there's a constant investment in the future. Um, we also have to support over 100 languages to even work with any of the manufacturers. Um, so it's non-trivial to kind of scale in, in that way. And then when you start working in big companies, um, unfortunately, you then have to support them. So we've got a professional services team which works with, um, with companies, as I mentioned earlier. And on the other side, we've then got a consumer team which manages relationships with our customers, um, so the community aspects of it, PR and marketing. 
So I think if you look across the whole of our company, we're trying to put as much resource in, as possible in making the product better. Um, so around 100 of our staff are all in, in the kind of technical parts of the business. Um, and then the rest of it, I think, is just a balance between what do we need in terms of offering great customer experience um, and marketing and sales, and then obviously the right size of, of overhead for that business. So I don't know if I've answered it satisfactorily, but that's kind of I don't, the next I, I, don't, I don't know what you took from that, but to me, that sounded like an awful lot of entourage. Just <laughs> for me. That's okay. Looking at all these tech companies, I'm really impressed with how quickly they take on people and how many people they seem to take on when actually the whole, it seems to me like the piece of magic is that two kids can work in a back room and end up on a global marketplace. Now, that seems to completely destroy the myth effectively in because now you've got to run a proper company like any others. Yeah. Silly so-and-so in this room. Um, and, and I'm just, that, that interests me because also the other thing is how many people who are doing all these things actually make any money at all, frankly. Uh, and you hear these lovely stories, and it'd be nice to be a billionaire, possibly, um, but most of them are, it's like the star system, you know, Hollywood star system, most of them are selling hamburgers in McDonald's. A noble calling in a turn, right? Were there any questions on this side of the room? We've had a, a lot from over here today. There's a gentleman here in the blue tie and the striped shirt. Thank you, yes. we. Following on from that question, there are those that have that light bulb moment and create an idea that ends up making millions. What advice would you give for the many mid-size businesses that get a light bulb moment that they will suddenly decide to move from lifestyle to growth mode? And how, what would be the top five things you would advise them to do if they were choosing to move in that direction? I don't know about top five. We might only take, <laughs> we might only take one or two. Gareth, do you want to take um, that? Well, I guess speaking with my, my experience hat on, um, I, I would very much think about managing the cash flows. Um, we, we, I know we saw in the research that, uh, that went into this report um, how even at the, the scale of business that we're looking at um, here within the, the medium-sized business world, cash flow is still critically important. Um, and if, if you lose sight of that, you know, you, you'll, you'll get too wrapped up in your in your light bulb moment um, and overlook the basics of uh, things like that, then it can all come crashing down around you. Yeah, Simon, so, mean, just coming, coming back to your thought about mindset, yeah. uh, the answer seems to be if you get a light bulb moment, don't switch the light bulb off. Well, behave like a startup. Um, so startups have no money. It's very inconvenient if you want to pursue an idea. Um, so that's why we have terms like minimum viable product. Uh, with digital now, it's perfectly possible to prototype your idea for very little investment and actually validate whether or not there is any market fit and whether or not there is any demand for your product. I've seen medium-sized businesses waste huge amounts of money and resource building an infrastructure to market test the product that frankly they could have faked in a half an hour uh, and achieved the same outcome. And, and so avoid that. Startups avoid it because they have no other option. So behave like a startup would be my idea. Okay, thank you uh, for your um, questions. I mean, what is the Startup Institute? The Scale Up Institute. Scale Up Institute. Um, I mean, essentially, the Scale Up Institute was born out of the, and much of what is being discussed now about scale ups, whether it be in tech or retail or creative industries, etc., has been born out of the Scale Up Report, which Sherry Kuti. Uh, was commissioned by the last government to undertake um, in looking at what were the barriers um, to growth companies. Because we are terrific uh, today at starting and, and helping companies start up. We've surpassed the US in that in 2011. We've now got to create the right environment to help those companies scale. Um, because that has just such, got such huge economic impact for this country. Um, and when looking at that, whether it be businesses themselves, business leaders like John, whether it be looking at the academic world um, and the research we've undertaken, there were core barriers to that scaling journey. Building leadership capacity, getting the right skills in, making sure access to markets was an area of, of, of feeling of growth, so whether it was going overseas or even getting into corporate supply chains, how, how that, that, that access was as easy and efficient as possible, getting the right finance structure around you and getting right the infrastructure. Those were sort of six teams that came, came forward. The private sector has seen that as such an important journey that we have to get right 
The Scale Up Institute has been uh, backed by a range of corporates, um, from Google to the Business Growth Fund to the London Stock Exchange, a range of other financiers and academic uh, institutions, to really focus in on how we create that lens and how we work with everyone, the ecosystem, the CBI, local and regional um, ecosystems and, and local policymakers, on making sure that lens towards helping scaling up businesses continue to scale and grow and how we get that support right is, is the focus of the Institute. Okay, thank you. I just want to get a, a, a sort of concluding thought from each of uh, John and Gareth. Either something that you'd like to do differently if you had a chance to do it again, or the most important thing that you've learned throughout the whole uh, process. Gareth, why did you go first? Um, I think for us, we are starting now and again through, through having experience as a, as a parent um, to operate more internationally. But I think for, um, for a number of years, it was always the thing that you know, we'd like to have. What, what we do in principle, we should be able to do it just as well in France and the Netherlands and the US and Australia as we do in, in the UK. Um, and uh, I, I was in the, um, the, the breakout session um, with, uh, with Lloyd's next door and, and the UKTI looking at exporting. And, um, you know, and now it came out from there that there's, you know, there's never been a... Um, an easier time or a better time to um, to go international, and I think uh, you know, it, it is one of the obvious ways that uh, you know that, that almost any business can scale up at you know at a rate that it just simply couldn't achieve just sticking within a, um, the, the local market. Okay, thank you, John. Um, just, I, I guess I'm very positive about the opportunity to set up business in this in this country. Um, I think it's a great time to do it, um, and I'd really encourage people. I think sometimes in the UK we're a little bit reserved, and we think. Oh, I've got this great idea, but you go out to Silicon Valley, everyone's got the startup they haven't yet built, and they're about to kind of launch it. And, and I think coming back to Simon's kind of point about the startup mentality, I think if you're hungry enough and actually um, you, you always are on that kind of life or death kind of edge, that gives you the hunger and, and the desire and the persistence to kind of keep going. And I think if you've got that beginning and I think you can keep going, I think then um, you can, can have the opportunity to build great com companies. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking a terrific panel. Um, Gareth Ramsey and John Reynolds, and Iron Grant and Simon Devonshire.